Welcome to the special event marking the 50th anniversary of the Pride Center of the Capital Region. Hi, I'm Ken Screven. And there was a time I remember when I first moved to Albany in 1976, there was a big lambda that was painted outside this building to let everybody know this was a place for gay people. In fact, it was called the Gay Community Center of the Capital District. And I actually lived next door for a period of time. And I got to know a few of the seminal people who were important to this community center, the late Ernie Ray and the late Joe Norton. The Pride Center was the first openly gay community center in America after the bombast of Stonewall. I'm Ashley Hopkins Benton, a senior historian with the New York State Museum for the Pride Center of the Capital Region's 50th Anniversary Oral History Project. So I thought we would start at the very beginning, and I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about how you first became involved at the Pride Center um, and what brought you in. Well, it was uh, 1970, I believe. Um, and we, uh, we got a visitor from the, uh, someone who was involved with the uh, uprising, Stonewall uprising in New York City. We had a drag queen, as she called herself, you know, not a trans person, but a drag queen. Um, and she told us about what had happened. We were having some of the same issues in this area with bars. The police would beat us up on a regular basis walking home from the bars. Um, so there were there were real issues here too, as well. We started the Gay Community Center, then it became the Gay Community, Gay and Lesbian Community Center, and eventually the Pride Pride Center, mm. as it became more inclusive over the years. Um, yeah, it just came out of that that movement in New York City that started everything, when uh, when they rebelled against the uh, treatment at, at the Stonewall Stonewall Inn, and uh, it reverberated nationally and internationally. So that's, that's what we, uh, we decided to organize. And then uh, we decided to start the Pride Center. And a bunch of us got together and decided to and, and, and help that happen. You talked a little bit about the first location. So can, can you talk about how it was first organized and who was involved? Sure, there were, I don't know, 12, 14 of us, 15 of us that decided to open up a, a, a Pride, well, a, community center and we wanted to hand out leaflets and just be a place a drop-in center coffee house whatever um, just a place to get together and meet uh, it worked very well it was a great idea a great concept we were the I think believe the first at the gay community center in this region it was in the beginning it was the uh, Washington Park free clinic and somebody owned it I can't remember I think it was a psychologist, psychiatrist, I'm not sure. He wanted to sell the building. Mm. So, so he knew Joe Norton and he, he offered to, to Joe before he put it on the market, he said he would sell it to us. Anyway, so we bought it. I think my first uh, introduction to the Pride Center was probably attending some sort of um, social event or uh, performance or, or something more than 20 years ago, probably more than 25 years ago. And uh, I became familiar with it and I immediately signed up to get their uh, monthly newsletter community, which was printed at that point in time. And uh, it was a lifeline. I was like a ship lost at sea. And I knew it was time to come out and really come out. I read about the Gay Men's Peer Support Group which literally, and I'm not overstating this, saved my life. And it took me a while before I, I finally decided I'm going in. And I climbed the front step, full, front, front stoop, that was the equivalent of a, a flight of steps, three more, and made it to the, to the room at the top where we met at that time. I was lucky to come in contact with a gay person, let alone a group of gay men. Mm -hmm. And it, the uh, group was at an all-time high at that point. It had our ultimate number, and I keep these in my journal, which I've been keeping since seventh grade. And the journals, when I read back about this night, that it's it's just it, it's hard to believe it ever happened. I mean, they welcomed us right away. 
Uh, I was a little bit early, and right away we started talking. But it suddenly came to it, the realization came into my mind that I'm in a group of like-minded gay men. You talked about working at the coffee shop at the center. Yes. How did you get involved in doing that? Okay, uh, through the peer support group, they somebody came in and said, "Look, we." Uh, we, this, the, the community center coffee shop is open seven days a week and we just we don't have that many people running it and people are there two or three nights a week and they ask is anybody there who would like to do it and I thought about it and I thought you know and I asked about it and they said you just basically sit there you answer the phone if it's something that you weren't comfortable handling you took their number and had somebody call them back mm -hmm. and we had coffee and soda and snacks and we would just charge them a minor fee for it and then just cash out at the end of the end of the night yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. people would come in just to hang out and have a cup of coffee and talk it was like it was almost like a, a customer service desk too and it was basically just being a host of you know of, of a coffee house How did it function on a regular basis? What, how, what were the meetings like? Well, it, it has definitely segued because I, I was asked to come back in by Mike Chapman at the time and David Reed, who were doing the group right after uh, or the Orlando tragedy. Mm -hmm. And I, because of my psych background and everybody being upset, I, I went for a few weeks. It, at that particular time, we met every Monday night at 7 o'clock. And we'd go around and you would do your check-in. And you could tell everything. I mean, there are things that I will take to my grave that were said in that room that would rock the world. Um, and and there, were, there were dark things. I mean, there were, there were people who said, I'm not going to come back next week because I want to kill myself. And they meant it. And a full 80% of the men there had been married. Everyone that was there would ultimately admit in that 80% that their wives knew that they were gay before they got married. And yet we all know that no matter what happens, it'll never come out. And that was the gift. And what was it like meeting there at the time? Did you have any interactions with people beyond the group that you were involved in? Well, I can tell you that those meetings were, were smoky. They were really smoky. And I think everyone was a little nervous. And so, you know, everyone was smoking and, and, and we would sit on the floor and you'd get up and you'd get up into this smoke because it was hovering uh, about halfway down from the ceiling. Some of the other people that I've talked to who were involved at that time were glad to have the space to meet as a women's group, but felt that the Pride Center was really a men's space. Did you get that, that vibe? It felt like that, yes, it felt like that. But the thing is, when we were there, it was a women's space. We were a bunch of very strong women and personalities. So when we were there, it was a women's space. <laughs> when there were, I remember the first march that we had on the, um, there were 5,000 of us and we couldn't get a permit to march on the streets of Albany. Hmm. So we had to walk single file down the sidewalks of Albany to the Capitol. When we got there, eventually we were 5,000 strong at least. So it was pretty remarkable. People showed up from all over the state. They were sleeping everywhere and they took hotel rooms and, and extra bedrooms or floor spaces if they had sleeping bags. We just put them up everywhere we possibly could. And it was just truly remarkable. I remember that that's probably the best dance I ever went to was at the Unitarian Church. They were very supportive of us on Washington Avenue. It was a dance before the march. The energy of that, the spirit of that was so together and so open and I, I just, I never experienced anything anything like that before and never have since. They, they had had limited pride activities, but this was a time when it really got into be a big thing into um, Washington Park. Mm, and okay. um, there would be like eight or 10 days of pride celebrations and events and, and um, which led up to the big march. Mm -hmm. We needed to be for people to know that, you know, we're the Pride Center and we need their support. Um, so we also talked briefly about um, 
your work on the Pride celebration? I think I was on a Pride committee for exactly 17 or 18 years at least. We used to meet really early. We would meet in like October for the next June. Wow. And they would invite anybody to join it. It wasn't like exclusive. And people would come and the first meeting, they would be like, okay, this is what we did last year. Some of them will probably keep, some of them will, you know, will probably discard because they weren't too popular. Mm -hmm. But if, you, and then the next meeting might be something like, if you have an idea of an event you want to do, just, you know, do some research on it. Let us know what you'd like to do. And then the next meeting, like in November, people would come in and say, oh, I want to do like a drag show, or I want to do like a, a trans lunch, or I want to do a bisexual brunch or, or whatever. You know they would do it so they said we could do more bowling or were there um specific events that that you helped plan that you're very proud of yeah well there's one in particular carmy hope and i uh i think it was actually carmy's idea carmy said we should do a, a a cabaret for kids a drag cabaret for kids and we just carmy just set up her uh equipment and some parents brought their kids in and we would sing to them and tell them stories and read, a, you know, just read something to them. Pat Whalen from the museum used to be on the Pride Committee too. Mm. You know, he said he would love to have that, you know, like to see if he could do that at the museum. So we've been doing it there for like the last 10 or 11 years. Mm. I have to tell you, one of my favorite stories is I was sitting there you know, getting ready to sing and this little kid walked in and went, ah, and what? <laughs> <laughs> they had to coax them back in. <laughs> it was great. I I have a picture of a kid who came to the first one, and 10 years later, I had a picture of him taken at Pride, and he still remembered the first one, and it was so cool. You know, Pride is very important. I mean, people think it's just getting out there and, like, you know, parading and having a party and everything. Visibility, you know? And that's because of the center, because they do it every year. And there's so many people that every year. And I think it's really opened us up to be, you know, a vibrant part of the community. Um, during Pride one year, because they have different events. Like Pride isn't just in the park. Pride is like a whole month where they have like bowling and, you know, miniature golf or whatever, anybody else. They just pick tons of different events to do in the month. And um, the bars get in on it and they do different things. And uh, there was a, it might have been another movie showing, I think, that might have been here, um, or a speaker. We actually had a Native American speaker who talked about Two Spirit, because that's a, a kind of a another little um, subset of our community, and uh, that might have been it. But what, what do you think, is of the the Pride celebration? Why is it important to grow it? And I mean, other than um, the fundraising, Pride, obviously. Well, the Pride but... celebration started off is, is we demand our rights. It's, and it's not just a celebration. It's also a reminder that we're here. And I mean, I don't know if it's the only one, the few segments of society that you actually have to come out to tell people who you are. All right, that's wrong. You know, we shouldn't have to tell somebody, oh, you came out, we're having a party. It's like, no, especially as rights start to get rolled back and chipped away. And yes, we've had a couple of great wins in the Supreme Court this year. It's hearts and minds. You can't legislate the hearts and minds. It's still a lot to do. We still need all of our corporate sponsors to stand with us. We still need all of our straight allies to stand with us. We still need as a community to stand together The next thing that occurred was changing the name. It was the Gay and Lesbian Community Center, Capital Region Gay and Lesbian Community Center. But now we were starting to get government grants and we were starting to develop programs and thought, felt like we were more than just a community center. And so made the decision after a lot of discussion to ch to change the name of the organization to the Pride Center of the Capital Region. So, so we ended up starting the Business Alliance. 
which was all businesses that either were gay or lesbian owned, transgender owned, or they were friendly to our to all of our people. And so we made sure that we, you know, we had listings, we had events that people could come and mix and, and exchange business cards and things like that. We'd never had anything like that before. And that was so important to do all that. I used to, I had a Christmas party every year at my home. It was totally dedicated to the Pride Center. The last year we did the party here, we raised $10,000 at a Christmas party. And we raised a lot of money and people talked about those parties all the time because those of us who have been fortunate and have had good jobs and have had good careers, you support and help other people and do the best you can for people because you you, know, you could be down that road too. And so I've always felt that it was up to me to you know, give my time, my talent, my treasures as much as I can to help other people out. And doing so through the Pride Center to me was very important and, and, and very enriching. And, and, and I wish more people felt that way. Mm. And so not only do they do this great programming and provide uh, that sort of service, but they would also, for people that were working in the community, provide a place for you to interface and to bounce ideas off. But yeah, it was always a wonderful hub and calendar um, for all the things that I've been involved with. Everyone uh, who was involved wanted to be involved. Like this is this is this is this is our service to our community, and the Pride Center always helped amplify and focus that, and that's why it was so important. Um, you've touched on the radio show. Can you talk about how you got involved and um, what you think the importance of the show is for the community? I was in the support group and they wanted me to do the um, do a promotion, which which I did. And I, they, Sean asked me to come over to the radio show, Sean McLaughlin. So I did this promotion and, and I, we got talking about Kevin on the Wonder Years. The show ends after two hours and he said, Ray, I want you to stay forever. I, I was suddenly at the show. So as soon as I had the chance to become um, executive producer, I thought, I'm going to tighten this up. And we, we made some changes. And my philosophy, my mantra with the show is, there is nothing we will not talk about. We went deep into uh, HIV, AIDS, and we talked about things that no one else did. You, you won't hear them anywhere else. But they had to pick up, pick a name for, for the show. And they had something, I think we had the exact name someplace. One of them, I'm sure, was Rainbow Radio. And then one of the people, he said, Home Radio, that's what'll work. Well, it's how many years later, 92 to now, to now and I think they were right. Uh, the guidance counselor at Albany High School wrote me a letter and said, Dr. Ray, you've saved lives as a result of the show. Uh, I mean, we have the highest rated college college radio show in the world. There are times I sit in teaching, I wonder if anybody's really behind you. You know, you're really, am I really connecting? And then somebody says that, somebody who's highly respected. I realize we've, we have to do this. And I'm very, very proud of that. He heard me sing, he said, you should come to Capital Pride Singers. So, you know, and so I, I joined them. I've been doing that for like 25 years now. Wow. Yeah, they've been, it's Capital Pride Singers. It's the one of the only gay and lesbian mixed choruses left in the country. There's only two or three left less I saw. Wow. But I, I also see a great improvement, you know, in, a, in the presence of Interim Voices and the Pride Center. I see them working together in, on various things. I think there was recently a forum that they worked together. And um, that I was glad to see, very much so. And the Schenectady Pride was involved also. Um, it just uh, that I see people at the Pride Parade with their, you know, straight people with their families and kids and wearing yellow, uh, rainbow flags, et cetera, et cetera. That would never have happened when I was a youngster. And uh, so I'm grateful to see that. Um,
Well, we uh, were the first place, I think, where the uh, AIDS Council of Northeast New York met. Mm -hmm. They organized there. We had the first uh, hotline there. And we had our, we had our own um, phone at the Bright Center, too, um, for counseling. People, just people who wanted to call with questions, you know, what do I do? Um, I'm gay, how do I deal with it, blah, blah, blah. Then the AIDS, the AIDS crisis came along. We were the one where they set up. They eventually went on their own because they got so powerful and so strong, got so much grant money. They were able to, you know, go on their own. Again, functioning of the Bright Center, why it was set up the way it, way it was. And that worked very well. The calls we used to get were pretty remarkable. You know, can I get it from the toilet seat? Can I get it from, uh, can I get it from the air? You know, it eventually helped. A lot of people began to die. Uh, I would say two thirds of the men that I met when I came to Albany are no longer here. To see that, to know that all these fellows that were your buddies were, no, were not here, they should be here with me. I started to count. I, when it got to be a hundred people, had passed away, I stopped counting. And that was a long time ago that I stopped because I couldn't, uh... yeah. Your work in Albany, um, a part of that was work on the human rights ordinance. Yes. and you were integral to that campaign. So can you talk about that work and how you became involved? Our doing the ordinance in Albany did have a ripple effect around the state and other communities tried to do the same thing. And over time, it, it did happen. And over time, we got the statewide law done. Mm -hmm. You know, Sonda was passed in early 2000s, the State Omnibus Non-Discrimination Act. Um, and so it paved the way for a, a lot of organizing and political work, and it paved the way for a lot of uh, electoral work. Anyone who was going to run for, for assembly or senate um, needed and wanted the support of the community because they knew we could raise money and we were a solid voting block. You know, if I'm sitting on the back of a convertible with a candidate during Pride, that sends a message that this is the candidate you want to vote for. But on a personal note, how do you feel that the Pride Center has impacted your own life? Just knowing that it's there and that it su provides support, especially to young LGBTQ people. Uh, and again, that's really been my main uh, and continuing interest. And the reason is that that's what gives me hope. Uh, if I had a pride center where I lived or close by when I was a teenager, uh, my life would have been filled with with hope. And having hope obviously makes a profound can make a profound difference in one's life. And so um, I would say that the pride center is a source of continuing hope and optimism. Um, you had also uh, related to that, um, I touched on the alternative problem. Could you talk about why that's important? <laughs> it's, it's incredibly important. I didn't know what to expect. I'm looking at these kids. These kids are so excited. I had to organize and set up more dances than I want to admit in those, that 20 year stretch. The alternative prom was, was God's gift to the world. <laughs> there were no problems. Everybody was happy. I, I really loved talking to them. So the alternative prom was, you know, it was the golden ticket. So yeah, we do the prom. The prom is an amazing event. I mean, that, and that's really the heart of all the events that I've ever been part of, even bigger than Pride. The prom is like the kids and seeing these kids that um, would never ever get a chance to do what they're doing and they're all in that room and there's a DJ and it's fabulous and it's just like amazing the energy to watch that 300 kids. We had a open mic night on a Friday night and it was for all of, all of the kids. So we had a house full of um, kids and, and their parents. So it started and kids get up, they wrote songs and sang poems they wrote and what have you. Eventually this young man gets up and he's um, 
begins his story. And he was talking um, that he had discovered who he was and he was getting very depressed because he didn't know anybody like him. He had one good friend that he confided in, mm-hmm. that who he was. And he told his friend that he was considering committing suicide. And uh, his friend said, well, you do know there's a Pride Center here in Albany. Let me take you there. And he said, that night saved my life. Mm -hmm. I did not know at the time his parents are standing right next to me and almost passed out. And that's when I looked around and realized this center does so much. They do unbelievable work here. Not only for the kids, but for adults too. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's been home. I mean, it's been a place to uh, to feel uh, comfortable. Um, not have to worry about what people think of you. I'm being uh, judged. Um, uh, it's been a great deal. It's made, made a big difference in my life. And, I, and I'm involved in the community. I've been a community organizer most of my life. I, was, I became a county legislator here in Munster County for five years, a few years ago. And I try to help the community. I used to tell people that I I don't help the community to get elected. I get elected so I can better serve the community. I don't know where I'd be without, without. I really don't like, um, I really needed what this place afforded me in the beginning. It's like being connected to an organization like this, just, it just, it grounds me. I might've relapsed. I might not have been able to stay clean. A lot of the gay community, gay, lesbian, trans, non-binary in our community, our bars are like kind of like you know community centers too you know and it gave me a place where it was safe to just pick people's brains and talk and like learn about who i was by figuring out who i wasn't i had recently come to albany from new york city and found my way to the pride center because we did a lot of meetings there a lot of organizing there. It was a place of refuge, um, as it was for many groups, but allowed a lot of people like myself who were in the process. When I moved to Albany, uh, I wasn't out. It was a place that allowed me to find my community, to get politically active. So the Pride Center is, for many of us, our kind of heart and center and soul to a lot of our activities. I think it's made all the difference to a lot of people. I think uh, there would have been many more suicides if, they, if it hadn't existed. Mm-hmm. There would have been a lot more problems with people's lives. Uh, I think it's made all the difference in uh, helping people adjust to the, to the notion of, of gay people, the LGBTQ people. Um, and just being part of the community. I think that it, gay people contribute greatly to our culture, to our society. We need to have the community center, uh, the pride center, maintained and, and, and prosper. And that there's a, you know, there's strength and there's, there's growth and the, and the, and the different uh, shades of colors of. Uh, the rain, the rainbow flag is, is, you know, different colors, and uh, and it's because of uh, the Pride Center, police people, and places like the Pride Center, there's been an impact, and I, I've seen it in terms of lawmakers, especially the legislators, and uh, I think it has had an impact uh, that has improved the life, not just of gay people, but I love to see these young families with their children waving rainbow flags. I said, yeah, this is, now that is progress to me uh, on a major scale. And it would not have happened had it not been for places like the Bright Center. I think, I think it's, a, it's a time capsule, but it's also, it's also our uh, terrible rocket ship to the future uh, that just came to me. It's, it shows the continuity of the presence of our community. It's, it's something we have too, it's like our Elks Lodge. The very brick and mortar reminder, the presence 
of our community and, and how important and the, the, the role we play in our community. And the Pride Center is our, is our home base. I remember being working in the budget division and one of the budget chiefs who I liked a lot, <laughs> he warned me, he said, I live across the street from the, the, the community center. I said, what community? The gay people, watch out. So to have that in your own neighborhood and to see the rainbow flag and to know you can go there. Mm. So we can only hope that the Pride Center continues to provide a positive haven, a presence, a legacy for the queer community of the Capital Region. But it can only happen with your support. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful and diverse community. And thank you for supporting the Pride Center of the Capital Region. <laughs>